everyone. Welcome to Around the Verse, our weekly look inside Star Citizens Development. I'm your host, Sandy Gardner, and joining us in the studio this week is Chris Roberts. Welcome back. Thank you. Good to be back and just in time to vamp it up for Halloween. So. Yes, we did. And you were visiting both UK and Germany offices, correct? Uh, yes, uh, I was catching up with our two Foundry 42 offices uh, in Wimslow up by Manchester and in Frankfurt. Um, and I was also overseeing some performance capture for 3.0 along with Dave Haddock, who actually did a lot of um, directing on some of the 3.0 stuff, did a great job. Very cool. And we'll actually be discussing how performance capture goes from the stage to in-engine later in this episode. But before we do, let's take a quick look on what's going on right now in the verse. Okay, well, the Super Hornet free flight just wrapped up. It's pretty cool to see the first impressions from new people who test out Arena Commander and the Alpha PU during these free flight events. Mm -hmm. And a big welcome to all of the new backers joining us. And thanks to all the veteran citizens for helping them get settled in. Yeah, thank you very much. They, they make uh, community special. They do. Looking ahead to our next release, 2.6 from all our studios. They're checking in stuff every day. Care to share? <laughs> in the hot okay. seat. <laughs> Pressure. Um, okay, well, we're playing Star Marine in Eternal QA every day. Uh, I had quite a fun session, actually, with Tony, Zervek, Aaron, Todd Pappy, and the German QA team last week when I was in Frankfurt. Uh, we have map and game mode adjustments based on internal play test feedback we're working on, which would include mine, of course. Uh, we're also working on network synchronization to reduce lag and make the smoother sort of client remote animation. In addition, we're making sure destructible props and glass work properly over the network. Helmet 2.0, which is item 2.0's implementation of the helmet, has just gone in with the new HUD and widgets. Combat emotes have been hooked up as well and will allow you to trigger them from the keyboard to allow you to signal your friends, taunt your enemies, uh, without having to break your FPS flow. There you go. And on the Arena Commander front, the designers are pouring through all the feedback we got from the last Evocati build and are taking another pretty big pass based on some of their feedback and some of our thoughts together. Yes, uh, I think people are going to like what we're doing. Uh, we're going to uh, go quite a bit further on the next iteration of flight changes. And in addition to that, uh, we're working on missiles to give them some much needed attention, to give them more variation and personality in how they behave. Very cool. Missiles are now persistent between respawns, and we're working on the game mode pickups to rearm or refuel mid-combat. And the UI team is hard at work on the new front end for Star Marina and Marine Commander, so there's a lot of work there. That one's going to come in very hot. Uh, and of course, we're getting the new ships in and tested for both Crusader and Arena Commander. I know you're all eager to get your hands on 2.6. Don't worry, we're working hard to finish up the content and features so we can release 2.6 to the PTU and then live. Now let's head over to our Austin office for a studio update. Hey guys, Jake Ross here, producer of the Austin Studio, and uh, here with you this week to talk about what's going on here in Austin. Uh, we're hard at work, working towards 2.6, 3.0, and beyond. Uh, first, I want to pass it off to Imra Switzer, lighting artist here in Austin, to talk about uh, lighting updates for the Star Marine maps. So with lighting in Star Marine, we're not specifically looking to highlight the players. Um, one of the, the elements of Star Marine's FPS is we're trying to build a more tactical gameplay experience. And so while in other first-person shooters you can use lighting to contrast the player and make it more visible, with the lighting in Star Marine we're, we're looking at it from a very realistic standpoint. So we're saying, okay, there's this pirate station which has been abandoned for quite some time. The pirates have went in. Um, all the original lighting fixtures probably have been to some extent destroyed or they're no longer functional. So what would the pirates do? How would they go in and, and actually light this environment for their purposes? So there's a lot of temporary lighting. There's a lot of lighting that's not what was originally there. Um, there's a lot of flickering lights, there's a lot of very moody lighting. Um, this again means that, that players are going to have to be a little bit more cautious when they're entering a new play space. They're going to have to cover their teammates, they're going to have to be a little bit more tactical in how they approach these situations. They can't just go in there guns blazing and, and hope to survive. Echo 11 has a lot of these different rooms um, connected by these tight intricate corridors and so each of these rooms have their own unique feel. Maybe they're owned by different factions or they're, they're ran by different people, but uh, each of these rooms has a distinct feel. That's also going to help with, with the teamwork element because you could give call-outs pretty easily. Say, so oh, I'm in, I'm in this blue room with, with all these crazy monitors and all your teammates would know where you are. So I'm really excited for Star Marine. I can't wait to get in there with all my friends, um, create a squad of you know, six guys and run around, run around one of these maps and, and shoot up the enemies. All right, so now we're, uh, we're going to pass it off to the QA team and the game support team here in Austin to talk about uh, testing for 2.6 and working with the Evocati. 2.6 will bring about a lot of changes in new content, some of which include a refactor to our lobby system, some new missions, an addition to Grim Hex, and also the new ships, the Hoplite and the Herald. QA has also been heavily focused on testing ship model changes, which includes a balance pass to 
uh, shields, weapons, and missiles. Uh, this has been a heavily iterative process where QA will provide feedback, design will make changes, then QA will test those changes and provide additional feedback. Each day we have a live release sync uh, for 2.6 where we'll get together, discuss any new blocker critical issues, any outstanding issues, and also get an, uh, an update of the build. Alongside with everything that's going in in 2.6, we're also heavily focused on Star Marine. Myself and my colleague Brandon Croker are both FPS specialists that work on Star Marine all day, every day. Basically what that means is we utilize checklists, we use something called ad hoc testing, which is kind of exploratory testing. One of my favorite ways of testing would be the cross studio play test. And basically what that does is uh, word goes out that we're making this cross studio play test. Everybody from all the studios come in and play against each other. Uh, after the play test, we all get the feedback, get the bugs. Um, I take all that information, put it into a single area, collate it down, and send it out to people who need to know about it. We are very excited to get Star Marine into PTU soon. That will ultimately help us get one step closer to the live release. There's a lot of new stuff coming in 2.6, some of which, like our flight model changes, are already in the hands of our volunteer Avocati testers, which have been a huge help. So Avocati Test Flight is some program that a program that we started in uh, February uh, of this year, and it's been hugely successful. It's made up 800 volunteers right now. Uh, they're from 20 different countries. They speak 18 different languages, and uh, they cover from they're they're from five different uh, continents around the world. So it's actually pretty cool. And so what Evocati does is take a build that is out of internal QA, but let's just say it's not ready for prime time. It's pretty busted, it's unfinished, it's broken, and a lot of times uh, the people who play are kind of masochists because they crash a lot, a lot of bugs. Things aren't exactly as fun as they, uh, they should be um, before they get out to you know, a wider audience. Well, the Evocati process is a pretty uh, difficult process. We vet all of them through an algorithm that we use to make sure that they're uh, active and dedicated in testing through the issue council. And we also double check them ourselves to make sure they're also you know, not just adding contributions randomly. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty hard to get into the Evocati test flight. You have to be quite dedicated, and everyone there really is. Well, working with the Evocati has resulted in an enormous amount of feedback via the Issue Council and via the PTU website. Um, we've just had to pour through a massive amount of tickets provided to the Issue Council, and they are miraculously not duplicates. Uh, they find just an enormous amount of bugs that we can actually find and fix and make sure that the servers are more stable for when we move over to our Way 1 PTU process. Um, in addition to that, th we have been provided so much feedback on the gameplay that we've actually had to find creative ways of going through the just sheer amount of feedback that they've been providing so that we, we can distill it down and provide it to the producers and designers to make changes to the game. Uh, thinking about some of the successes of Evocati, uh, I, th I think back to 2.3.0. If you remember, uh, that, was, uh, that was a long time in waiting, and once it got out, it was terrible. It was just crashy had lots of bugs, and literally was not fun, but also wasn't ready to go out to the public. And so uh, that was, uh, I think it was a, a fun time for the volunteers because they had you know, uh, a common bond that they all went through. But the, uh, the, the, the reality is that it took a long time to get that build ready before it went out to the PTU and ultimately to the public. So that was, uh, I think, a good month of pain for the volunteers, but they hung in it. Uh, they gave us lots of feedback. Uh, we were able to get that stuff fixed and out the door. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, now, now we're going to hand it off finally to Jason Ely and the back-end services team uh, to talk about uh, the updates that they got going on uh, in their world. So uh, lately we've been working on a number of things. Um, we have uh, Ian who's been working on, um, well he built a, our service discovery uh, uh, platform which allows the services to easily connect to each other, identify and connect to each other. Um, and now he's been working on like admin and customer support tools. Um, while Tom's been working on um, you know a lot of things, he's he's our number one firefighter, and he also has been working on like leaderboard and matchmaking, uh, you know, uh, modifications for the upcoming patch. Um, I've been working on um, let's see, so far it's been the hub server rewrite has been the, my biggest chore lately. Uh, it's been uh, quite uh, the ordeal. It took about a month to do from beginning to end. So. Much of what we do in the back end is never really um, seen directly by the, the players. But um, in rewriting the hub server, what we did was I, I took time and simplified the threading model um, and um, 
converted it over to support our new architecture, obviously, which is just how we handle messages and routing, um, which greatly reduces the amount of uh, memory moves we have to do from one, po one network point to the other network point. Uh, we've also removed some of the state and isolated some of the state into one thread, which makes communication a lot easier. Um, it, I mean, performance-wise, it's, it's nothing that the player is going to know. It's more of a, a throughput issue from an overall, you know, a larger perspective. We can move more data to more clients um, without exhausting the machine that it's running on. Originally, uh, it was the first service uh, written, uh, actually by Tom Sawyer back uh, a number of years ago, and uh, it was uh, the most uh, reliable server at the time. It ran like three and a half months solid with no problems. Um, over time, before I got here, um, you know, it, it, it grew, it went through the growing pains, uh, had some, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen, uh, some complexities that were introduced that were unnecessary. Um, and so it didn't grow gracefully. So when I came on, um, you know, we started the new uh, service architecture, which brought us persistence and Jim. Um, we always knew that we were going to have to address a uh, hub server, but it was so it had grown into something it wasn't meant to be. Had a lot of state, and so it took a quite a bit of uh, a time to address it. So we just never had that opportunity. So we saved the best for last. The Arena Commander and Star Marine UIS are getting a major facelift this round, and uh, we're really trying to polish up the UIS as much as possible and make them fully functional. Uh, the thing that I work on the most is the C++ code that has the UI system interact with the server backend. And uh, there's information in the lobbies that need to be shared between all players when they're in the lobby, such as like what map they're in, uh, you know, what game mode, uh, you know, their character, uh, you know, loadout for Star Marine or their ship selection for Arena Commander. So I focus on, uh, you know, propagating that information and syncing it up between all the clients. I kind of consider ourselves like a second generation, you know, matchmaking system. Um, it's where you form a lobby or a group of players or a party of your friends, and uh, you know you you can uh, you know chat with each other. But at some point, uh, you hit you know match me into a game. And at that point, then you know, your request goes to the backend servers and the matchmaker is taking a look at all the game instances that are currently running and uh, tries to do a best fit match you know, for, for your group uh, to join a game. Uh, if there's no game mode, obviously, then you know, the, uh, uh, the general instance manager will pull a server from the open pool and assign you to that and then other players will be matched to that over time. Like a third generation, you know, matchmaking system is kind of like what you see in like Battlefield or you know Call of Duty, where you just get this you know massive you know super lobby and you see players uh, you know come and go, getting matched into it, and you see a timer you know going from two minutes to zero, and if it's got enough players, then you know it then shunts all the players to game instances. We're more like uh, you know like uh, Overwatch or Heroes of the Storm, you know, where you you, f you form your group first, then you match into a game. All right, thanks guys. Uh, that's all we have for you this week. We're going to get back to it. Uh, thanks and see you around. We've mentioned the backend servers and lobby system a number of times recently. What makes these updates so important for 2.6 and beyond? Uh, well, we're really focusing on sort of the user experience. So we're trying to make the ability for players to connect with their friends, to play matches, customize their ship, or the character much easier and quicker, as well as check out the standings and do it all from the same place. So it'll just be a, a better experience. Speaking of connecting players, it's time for this week's community update. Take it away, Tyler. Hey everyone, Tyler Whitkin, Community Manager in the Austin, Texas studio, here to bring you this week's community update. First and foremost, I hope you all had an epic Halloween, and I wanted to give a quick shout out to Kin Shadow and Redfang87 for their Star Citizen themed pumpkin carvings, which were posted on our website earlier this week. Very cool stuff. And just as a reminder, the Asperia Prowler Art Contest is still going on. We're going to be accepting submissions through November 11th and announcing the winners at the anniversary live stream on November 18th. We're really excited to see what you guys come up with. In other news, Star Citizen has been nominated for Most Wanted Game for the Golden Joystick Awards. There's only one more day to vote, so if you want to follow the progress, you can go to gamesradar.com slash golden joystick awards. And now it's time for this week's MVP. I want to give a huge congratulations to Lund Fasai for his extraordinary efforts in creating Starship42.com. This is a one-stop shop where you can go in and explore the ins and outs of all of our ships in a detailed 3D viewer. I encourage you to check it out and you'll quickly find that you're losing hours of your day exploring this website. So congratulations again Lund Fasai, you're this week's MVP. 
Lastly, the week would not be complete without Reverse the Verse, so make sure to tune in live tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time at twitch.tv slash SIGcommunity, where we're going to talk about everything that you saw in today's episode. Thanks again for all your support, and we'll see you in the verse. Thanks, Tyler. Awesome stuff. For more on the latest, make sure to check out our community hub on the site. There you'll find our social media feed, featured forum posts, links to Star Citizen streamers, information on up-and-coming Bar Citizen events, and much more. Lots of stuff. And at the top of the show, we talked a little bit about the most recent performance capture session. PCAP is a big part of making the Star Citizen universe come alive. Recording voice, face, and body all at the same time gives us a nuanced performance from the actors that we couldn't get any other way, yep. uh, even if the head cam gets a little uncomfortable. Yeah, you would know the head cam any uncomfortable. Um, so anyway, it's a great tool, uh, but one that involves a lot of attention to detail to get right. So it's not just capturing someone, uh, it's about uh, understanding the precise metrics of what they're interacting with. So the animations will work together with the props and the sets to look natural uh, in pretty much any situation. For more on that, let's go back to our Austin studios for a behind the scenes look at how we create all these animation assets. Today we're going to talk about animations and how we get them from concept into game. And the process at which we do that is design comes to us and says, hey, we want something. So we say, okay, how can we do this? One of the things that we have to think about whenever we shoot motion capture or something that we need for the universe are our metrics. How are, what are the measurements? Are, is this character interacting with an object? Uh, is this character interacting with other objects? Is the character interacting with the player? There's a lot of thought processes that go into this to, to figure out exactly what we need. For example, if a character is sitting at a mess hall, we need to get the metrics of that mess hall table. We then have to go out on stage and we have to build out that mess hall table uh, to approximate dimensions that you see in game. Uh, this leads to a standardization across all mess hall tables in game, so we don't end up having uh, you know, 20 different mess hall tables that we now have to, instead of 50 animations, we're now, you know, doing, you know, 150 animations uh, in order to accommodate every mess hall table that we have, or bed, or chair, or bench, or locker, you name it, whatever you can interact with, uh, there's a metric for it and a standardization. So we go out on the stage, we build out these props or set pieces, uh, and then actors are given very specific directions on how they're supposed to approach these objects. Uh, these are also part of the metrics. For example, uh, when you want to sit down on a mess hall table, the actor has to approach that mess hall table and their left foot has to hit at approximately 100 centimeters out, or one meter out from the, from the bench. Uh, once they hit that mark, uh, which actors are usually pretty good at hitting marks, uh, they can do whatever they want to sit down onto that bench. And that's where we get kind of the fun acting that you see on the NPCs. Hey guys, I'm working on uh, Squadron 42. Uh, these are assets that are going to be uh, in Squadron 42, but eventually we'll be able to implement these into uh, the persistent universe. So uh, we had to do a couple things. Just like Brian said, we've you know, uh, made sure that you know, all the tables are now to a proper metric so that we can, we can reuse uh, the performances. Uh, but now that we've got this stuff in place, but it's really cool because um, you know, and these obviously these are these are blocked. These actually come from uh, one of our uh, uh, more organic cinematics. So even though maybe this this one wasn't intended to, we weren't intending to use this for for in game. Um, there's always an opportunity to look at some of that stuff and go, oh, you know what? I can extract that and make that something that's uh, that has uh, some reusability, and maybe we can apply this to. Uh, the persistent universe. So here's another one. This is the hungry guy comes up and is, is waiting in line for, uh, for the mess hall. So this is all from an initial sheet. We actually have another one that's coming in that has um, uh, a lot more, a lot more stuff in it. Once we get the data back, the first thing we have to do is we have to go through and we have to analyze all the data. We got to make sure that the uh, data handed to us uh, from the mocap stage is uh, clean and that there's no problems with it. Uh, we then uh, go through a process of usually cutting the animation apart into different segments. Uh, when you use an object, like if you want to sit down in a chair, you have to break it into at least three segments. Uh, an enter, so you actually sit down onto the chair. A cycle, where you're cycling like I am right now on a chair. And then an exit, where you actually get up and you exit away from the chair. 
and these are what we call animation sets. These animation sets are very important uh, to have a complete set in order to have an AI fully be able to go and use an object. And these animation sets are definitely expandable. We can, we don't have to just have one cycle of the guy sitting on the chair. The guy can be like leaning on his hand or, you know, scratching his neck or picking his nose or, or adjusting his earbuds or, or whatever, you, whatever we can come up with uh, that character can do in that chair will we'll shoot or animate or, or, or create, um, whether it's motion capture or whether it's hand key. And then whenever it goes into game, uh, code will sit the character, the AI, down into the seat and then randomly play these uh, actions uh, that you see. Hi, my name is Vanessa Landeros, and today I'm going to show you what we've been working on. And this guy will look a little funny because he doesn't have his textures on his hands, but it's basically this is what you're going to see when the char background characters are in their beds, just kind of sleeping or fussing around, just like tur tossing and turning here and there. A little fun stuff. We want to make sure we get a real experience as real as we can get in the game. So we have these little minute details, which you probably wouldn't see in any other normal game, but, uh, but this is what kind of makes our citizen so, so real and, and we're, we're working towards something really, really believable. Yeah, and then the NPCs are going to be able to get in and out of their beds too. So, going to be able to walk in, lay down, and the player will be able to get to do this too. Just, we need to make sure we get ins and outs. Also, some of every angle, so we can capture those possibilities. The character, if he wants to enter from the front, he can enter from the front. All of those need separate animations. Going to be able to see a janitor in-game uh, use a mop and a bucket. You know, just gonna clean up after all the star citizens. Yeah, potentially this guy is gonna have a walk cycle of his own. He's not carrying his bucket right now, but you'll just see him kind of drudge a bucket round with his mop. be fun once we get this guy up and going. Just that little extra detail that kind of really makes the game as cool as it is. So I'll put it on full screen for you there. When he's done with his area, he'll just pick up his bucket and he'll go. So when we pass these animations off on design, design has something called a usable, which is a an object that's placed in the universe that has these little entry nodes and attach nodes. And we have usables for pretty much everything that you can interact with. Uh, AI will say, I want to use that chair. Uh, so design will have placed this usable node on a chair. AI will navigate to that chair, align its, by the time it gets to the chair, it will have lined itself to the entry nodes, uh, attach, sit down, and use that object until it's ready to get up and leave. And while that object's being used, other AI will be like, I want to use a chair. Well, that one's taken. What's the next available chair? And then they'll, they'll nav uh, to wherever the next usable chair is, or they'll wait, or they'll change their mind and go off someplace else. Sometimes we get requests that um, we don't have motion capture for, or we don't have time to go shoot motion capture, or maybe the motion capture stage is tied up doing cinematics for us at the time. Uh, and it'll be something that we have to get out right away. So what we'll do is we'll go and we'll hand key whatever that motion is. Sometimes it's temporary and we'll replace it later with proper motion capture. Sometimes it's uh, uh, not super significant. So we'll go in there and we'll just hand key it and make it look really nice. So we're starting to work on pot tool animations. Uh, high work zones, low work zones, and we have floor work zones. So with this uh, character we've got, uh, we're going through and He's still a work in progress, so we've got uh, transitions that we need to clean up and things like that. But here you can go through, you can see like here's a full performance, we've got finger animation. This is actually one of the performances where we didn't have time to shoot the mocap, so we've actually gone through and, and hand keyed these. So this is the high work zone, 
Uh, just so you can see there's a little bit of difference, like he, he pulls out his pot tool and flicks it. And what's cool about this is that this isn't a unique one-off animation. This has high reusability. You can use this on ships, you can use it on buildings, you can use it pretty much anywhere. For weapons vendors, we want it so you can actually pick the weapons up, take them off, and look at them. So from third person, this is what you would typically see. So the, you know, it looks like the character's picking up and examining it. Uh, some of these we didn't have time to go through and, and uh, mocap, or we just needed, you know, there's something we, some things we, we you know, we realized after shooting, we're like, oh man, we need this, but we got to get this, this thing turned around. So that's a situation where I'll have to go in and I'll have to, I'll shoot video reference. I'll get in a general idea of, of what, we, what, we, what we need. Here's where I'm just checking a weapon. And then this is the hand-keyed result of that. And so this is, this is tailored towards uh, for uh, first person for player. I'm gonna say the, probably the most challenging aspect of all of this is uh, consistency in whatever it is that we're doing. For example, if a character needs to go and use a data pad uh, and go around and inspect things with that data pad, uh, that that data pad becomes a metric and it becomes standardized and that all data pads in the game now match this in particular data pad. Uh, it's letting design know that when a character is going to sit down and use Moby Glass uh, that that animation can be used across the board and that everybody's aware of these animations so nobody's re-requesting things that had already been um, finished. And that's just a taste of what players will see in the upcoming releases. Hope you guys enjoyed. That'll do it for this episode. Remember to tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. PST, 5 p.m. GMT for Reverse the Verse. Mm -hmm. And we'd also like to thank all of our subscribers, as always. You guys make it possible to produce all of this content from ATV, RTV, Bug Smashers, Lore Makers, and more. Thank you very much for your continued support. And guess what? We are in the Guinness... Book of Records. Yeah, look at that. Records again. All right. Third time in a row. <laughs> Very exciting. Do you recognize this ship? Yes. Uh, and also, like we'd like to, this is a bunch of nice gifts we got during uh, Citizen Con. So, very cool uh, model of uh, X Wing there and uh, some alcohol that I'm scared to drink. And uh, belt <laughs> buckles from uh, Operation Pitchfork. And Cartel. And Das Cartel. Very guard frequency. Yeah, very All these cool. very cool. And a very, very cool um, challenge coin here. Um, so thank you all guys, uh, and um, you know, thank you for supporting us. Uh, we couldn't do this without you guys, and I would say until next week... We will see you... Around the Around verse. The verse. for watching so if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in star citizen and squadron 42's development please follow us on our social media channels see you soon